my name is Adam Benet, and I am the Center of Excellence for Digital Innovation Lead at EECD. And today I'm joined with a very special guest, uh, Xander Gobin from the New Brunswick Association of Planners. And today we're uh, conducting a, a webinar to talk about the sort of work that um, planners do in our communities, in our provinces, and across every country and uh, why it's important and the different technologies that they might use in their day-to-day -day jobs. So uh, I'll turn the floor over to Xander and uh, I'll uh, let you go uh, take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much, Adam. Uh, as Adam said, my name is Xander Gopin and I will share my screen and presentation. So hopefully that's up. For everybody um yeah looks good great so today we're going to be talking about planning and what planning is and uh my day job um is senior planner uh for the southwest new brunswick service commission we're based in saint stephen but i do work uh, across charlotte county up a little bit into york county uh, from mcadam and uh, there are planners, uh, senior planners, junior planners, urban planners, um, working in pretty much every community in the province and, as Adam said, across Canada and across the world. So before we uh, jump into me telling you what planning is, um, it would be great to sort of think about what do you think a city or town planner does? Um, why do you think it's important for towns, cities, and provinces to have this sort of thing? And how could the planning of a city or town impact your own life? And these are good questions just to think about as you go through life. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, don't know that this work goes into the places that they live, and there are people behind the scenes thinking about everything and where streets are and where homes are and where businesses are. But um, that's that's basically the work that planners do. And once you start thinking about it and seeing the impacts of it, uh, I think it can really change the way you see the world, even if, if even if this isn't a career um, you end up going into. So I do have a little quiz. Uh, we'll have some quizzes throughout the presentation. And if you uh, use your phone or however to scan that QR code, it should take you to that quiz which the first one is going to be, what do you think professional planners do? And uh, there's some options there. One is correct. Do we plan events? Do we plant gardens? Do we give financial advice? Uh, do we plan communities? So uh, oh, one last one option there is, do we actually physically build bridges and streets? So I'll give everybody a minute just to select your answer there. Hopefully that's working. And the correct answer is plan communities. Although we do, uh, planner is a kind of vague job title. In French, it's urbanisme, which is a, a little bit closer to uh, cities. But um, in English, we're just kind of planners, community planners, urban planners, town planners. Um, and we plan communities. So we've got a little video here uh, that was produced by the Nova Scotia planners, and it's a really nice little overview. Um, and uh, at least it's maritime content. New Brunswick Association of, Association of Planners are working on a similar video, uh, but we're not quite done yet. So you're going to have to uh, pretend that Halifax is Moncton and, and everything else.
obviously about the New Brunswick Association of Planners as well. There's also the Canadian Institute of Planners, which is the uh, the Canadian body that represents us. Um, but I think that's a really good overview. And through the rest of the presentation, I will touch on some of those topics. And because um, we're here at the Center of Excellence for Digital Innovation, I will talk a lot about the digital innovative tools that uh, planners use in their day to day jobs. Um, but I think you'll also get a really good sense of what planning is. So urban design uh, is really how do things look in your community? Um, and, and one thing that planners do a lot of, as the video showed, was we do research. Uh, so this is a height map from the community of St. Andrews. Uh, this is something that I made. Planners do make lots of maps, and uh, I think everybody should love maps, but um, I especially love maps and I love making them. So this is all using, uh, it's called LIDAR technology, which is a little bit like sonar, which you may have heard of. Um, if you've ever seen one of those uh, movies where people are in submarines and they have to send out a, a, a message to know where, you know, the the iceberg is they're using sonar. So they're sending out um, sound waves and then measuring the time it takes for that sound wave to come back to them. And it's also how uh, bats figure out where they're going. So that's a pretty cool technology. LIDAR is a little bit different. It actually uses lasers. Um, and instead of being underwater, it's uh, usually done from the air. So uh, it's you can you can determine without actually having to go and measure how tall different things are. You can see different landforms. Uh, you can even find some of the coolest applications of LIDAR are looking at uh, jungles in, in uh, Mexico, and they found, um, probably got the actual group wrong, but uh, indigenous, uh, I think Aztec ruins that you can't really see from the ground because it's covered in forest. But this technology allows you to see through it. What we use it for, and this map is uh, is height. So we're looking at how tall the different buildings are in downtown St. Andrews. And that helps us get a sense of if there's going to be a new building um, going in between some of those buildings, what height should it be? And this is, uh, you can download Google Earth for free. It's a pretty cool, powerful tool. Uh, and it's, it's also using LiDAR. Um, and they're actually modeling um, they're basically creating 3D models of those buildings in real time and then overlaying satellite imagery on top of it. So this is not exactly a picture here, um, but that's in downtown Fredericton. And you can sort of hopefully get a sense of, well, if you have that height map and you know how tall the buildings are on either side of where that crane is, um, that building that's going to go there should probably be in between those two heights to create a nice streetscape. If it was way taller than either one, it would look pretty out of place. If it was way shorter, uh, it looks out of place. And obviously having nothing there um, is not great urban design. So uh, I don't know if anything's actually, if there's a crane in that picture, there's probably a building there now. We can also um, not just kind of try and think of what the future should be, but we can also project into the future and use technology, um, computer graphic technology, CG imagery, CGI. Uh, most movies these days are using that for all the big fancy explosions and um, uh, you know the creatures and everything, but it's used in very practical settings as well. So this building here in downtown St. Andrews does not exist. Um, that is completely rendered out of uh, computer imagery, um, but it obviously gives you a sense of what that street corner would look like if that building was to be placed there and, and can help people get a sense of the impact it would have. You can do similar things uh, with less kind of photorealism. Um, this is from, I, I believe it's downtown Moncton's uh, plan. And it's a little bit more of an artistic rendering um, of what different things can look like. But it's, you know, when, when we're going into communities and saying there's a proposal for this thing to go here, uh, it's very, very helpful 
to have things like this so that people get a sense of what it actually will look like when it's there. Another way that we try to predict the future is by looking at demographics. Uh, demographics basically means what is, who are the people in your community? What, what are the things about them? How old are they? Uh, what kind of jobs do they have? Um, you know, how many children are people having? What kind of homes do they live in? It's, it's all that information about the community. And when we plan, we're trying to think, uh, you know, 10 years in the future, 20, even 50 years in the future. So knowing what that population is going to be like in the future is very important for planning for the future. And um, this graph here is called a population pyramid. Uh, and what it shows is in, in the gray is what the population is like now. So um, the left is males, the right is females. And uh, there's really, most populations are pretty even. Um, but the important thing is where does it kind of bulge out? And with this one, you can see it starts to bulge out uh, around the age of 45. So in New Brunswick in 2018, um, our the, not the majority, but the kind of the biggest part of our population was between 45 and 70. Uh, and there, you know, there's more people there than there are in the younger ages. And as people age, they have different needs for their communities. You might need more accessible um, buildings, uh, accessible places for people to live where they're not going to have to go upstairs, things like that. So. Um, that's a very important part of planning communities is trying to predict the type of people who are going to be living there. And uh, what this this graph is kind of showing a few different scenarios of what New Brunswick will do uh, in 2043 based on, you know, uh, immigration, based on um, the number of kids that people are having. And you can kind of see that this bulge moves up. So those aging people are going to keep getting older. Um, and there's some scenarios where that's more extreme and some scenarios where that's less extreme. Unfortunately, there have been a lot of mistakes in planning and the way that towns and cities have been developed. And uh, there will probably be more. But one of them, um, and maybe you live in a place like this and, and maybe you're frustrated by it, um, if you don't have a car, they can be really hard to get around. This is a suburb uh, somewhere in the United States, not in New Brunswick. But uh, what this is showing is that you could have two houses which are literally next to each other. But because of the way that a street grid is laid out, it's going to take 14 minutes to drive there, uh, even though you're basically next to it. And if you could just hop the fence, you would be there. Um, I was actually visiting family in the Boston area a couple of weeks ago. And I had two family members in the same suburban neighborhood. They should have been about a 10 minute walk, but I could not walk. There were no sidewalks and the way the streets were designed, um, it would have taken me way, way too long to walk. And I wouldn't have felt very safe because there were no sidewalks. So I had to get in my car and drive and, you know, uh, emit some carbon and not get that exercise and you know it's just usually nicer to be out in the fresh air um so this is a mistake that planners made a lot in the 1950s as as we plan communities and we're learning um and now we focus more on how to revitalize downtowns and create these kind of dense uh thriving environments and fredericton is not a bad example of this uh, but this particular uh, bus depot here, uh, right in downtown Fredericton, on the right, that's part of a mall, uh, is pretty bad urban design. It's it's not particularly welcoming. Um, doesn't seem like a very nice place to wait for a bus. And uh, I, I per personally, it's one of my least favorite parts of Fredericton. One of the ways that we can avoid making mistakes is by focusing on user experience. And that's something that you hear about with digital innovation all the time. Uh, sometimes people just call it UX, but what are people actually going to do with the technology that you give them? Uh, if you don't give people the right instructions, they might not use it right. Um, in, in this case here, 
uh, designers obviously wanted right angles, um, but people uh, want to save a little bit of time. So they're cutting the corner, literally, and they've done it so many times that it's created uh, what we actually have a word for this in urban planning. It's called a desire path. So what people want to do is not what was designed. And if this little sidewalk area had been well designed and thought about how people would actually use it, maybe done some studies of the site and watched people, uh, they would have learned that having a right angle there is a waste of pavement and concrete. And that um, if they wanted to focus on accessibility, they would have put the curb cut uh, where that desire line is. This is, um, I believe this is Sackville. Uh, and it was done, hopefully you can see the little people moving around. Uh, this is a very cool piece of digital innovation done by a New Brunswick company called Black Arcs. And they use modeling um, and actually transportation modeling, not just a, a building, like we looked at some of the buildings that were modeled. Um, they're actually looking at if you add new buildings in different places, how will the ways that people move around the community change? Um, and then they actually show that uh, happening. Um, so the I don't totally understand this, but it, it looks pretty cool. So we're going to do another little quiz, and this is uh, just just to kind of get you thinking about street grids and the different ways that communities can be laid out, the impacts that they may have. Um, and instead of one right answer, this is a matching quiz. So hopefully you've got it up uh, on your phone or whatever now. So we've got these different street grids on the right. And on the left, there are six different communities in New Brunswick, some big, some small. Tried to hit every corner of the province. Um, and so you should be able to, with the quiz, uh, select a number and match it to a letter. So I'll just give a few minutes there, but it's very interesting um, to see how different they look and some of the reasons why they look different. I don't have any physical features on these maps to, to make them a little bit uh, harder to tell, but there are some which are pretty clearly impacted by the physical features around them, and some which are probably less impacted by those. So hopefully everybody's had a chance to make some guesses. So A is San Quentin, and uh, that is a very basic street grid. It You could almost imagine it anywhere. There's no real physical features that are impacting it. Uh, next, we've got Sackville, and so you can kind of see in the bottom, you've got some of that marshland um, that that really uh, defines Sackville, in my mind at least. Fredericton, um, maybe you could tell that that's the St. John or the Wollastook River in the middle there, and you've got the south side and the north side. Uh, that's kind of a not an uncommon uh, city form uh, to have a river dividing two halves of a city. Miramichi, um, kind of the same situation, although the history of Miramichi is uh, a lot of smaller communities that were um, kind of smushed into a bigger one, but very much defined by the river. St. Andrews, uh, which is a peninsula, very much defined by the ocean around it. But it also has a very classic uh, street grid. Um, when you see those kind of just square boxes, that was a very common way of laying out towns. It's very efficient. You have lots of connections. Um, so it's it's kind of the go to. Uh, and it was St. Andrews was laid out in in the 1700s. Uh, and I believe Fredericton was um, St. John would have been too. You can see that same street grid. You can see the St. John Harbor there. Uh, so hopefully you got some of those right, and maybe you learned what some other communities look like. As we are dealing with climate change, uh, planning has 
a lot to do with it and where people live. Um, it, you know, you don't have to turn on the news and watch for long to, especially in the spring and in the summer and during hurricane season to see a place where people's homes are getting flooded. Um, we have some really good digital tools that help us predict the future and where those places will be. And then we can, um, you know, also see how deep water will be in certain places. And there's different impact for something that's going to get, you know, a few centimeters of water over land. That's probably not a huge deal for a park or something like that. Um, but then if you have significant flood depth, then that might be really can't develop anything there uh, ever. Um, so we're seeing these adaptations and, um, you know, people trying to figure out ways to raise things. Um, you know, maybe maybe you just let water in and and it's able to flow in easily so it doesn't the force of the water doesn't damage anything. Um, there's there's all sorts of different ways to adapt to climate change. Obviously, we should be working on ways to mitigate it as well. But once we have these digital tools, we can use them uh, to help us set policies and say, you know, we know or we can predict that areas in red on this map are going to be impacted by flooding um, by the year 2050. And so there's different rules for what to do if you build a house there. So you can't have anything in the basement, basically. Um, but there's some other things too. So that's a policy. You know, if we get a, somebody wants to build something in one of these red areas, because we have that predictive technology, we're hopefully uh, saving that person and possibly the taxpayer and the municipality, the burden of having to deal with that house flooding. Um, and, and again, these can help us. Uh, these are slightly different. Uh, they deal more with big rainstorms and where uh, groundwater will rise to the surface, but that's also not going to be good for development. Um, so they're another cool tool that we use. And this, uh, going back to that LIDAR thing, if you remember, um, places that are going to flood are not great to build in. Uh, neither are really steep places. Um, there are things that you can do. You can you know, use dynamite and blast it out. Uh, you can add tons of fill. But the less we impact an environment, the, the more the environment is going to be able to operate kind of as it should as an, as an ecosystem. So my own personal philosophy, I like to look at all these natural features and hazards and instead of saying how can you build on top of them and kind of get rid of them how do you avoid them and so this mapping technology is uh incredibly useful for that um uh, you can go out in the field and i'll talk a little bit about that but um being able to see these things from a desktop from my computer very very helpful um so looking at climate change here uh this is looking at temperatures and how temperatures will increase in, in various places. This is up uh, north in the Edmonston area. Um, and they're going to see some pretty significant temperature increases, as you can see from this graph. And that's going to impact their infrastructure. Um, so uh, when the way that temperature, this kind of annual temperature increase is going to impact their infrastructure up there is usually in the winter, historically, it just freezes. It's really cold. It's cold for a long time. Um, there's no thawing. And if you've learned about uh, the different states of water, maybe in, in some of your science classes, you might know that when water freezes, it also expands. So if you think about your road, it has all these tiny little cracks in it. When the water gets in there, uh, like let's say it rains and then the next day it freezes, that's going to expand and it's going to make those cracks a little bit bigger. So over time, that effect is going to impact the road and you're going to have to pave it more. Um, and that's that's called a freeze-thaw cycle. And it's something in southern New Brunswick we, we deal with a lot. Uh, we're dealing with it more. Um, but up north, it isn't something they've had to deal with much because generally they've just frozen and stayed frozen. And so there's a little bit you know, at the beginning of the season when things freeze and then things don't move. But as you have these higher temperatures, they're going to experience more of that. It's going to have more impact to their roads. And uh, that has planning implications. It's going to impact the way that um, 
you know, they design their roads, uh, the materials that are used, obviously engineering is going to be part of that. But having these tools to predict the future makes planning for the future so much easier. Uh, the other big impact of climate change that's I deal with a little bit down here is erosion. Um, so as you have more of these rain events and they're heavier rain events, and uh, I think we all know we're getting something tomorrow, um, you get more of this type of activity and banks along rivers, along oceans, um, they are more likely to uh, erode and you literally lose land. The land is washing into the water. And as that gets closer to people's houses, that's gonna start having impacts. And uh, the um, Acadian Peninsula in New Brunswick is, is where we're seeing that the most right now. Um, so people want to do things to protect their shorelines. And some things are good and helpful and, and revegetation. So planting stuff and getting those root systems back in there, that's that's one of the best things that can be done. Um, but there are other things that people can do that will impact their neighbors and cause more erosion on their neighbors. So some people just want to put in a big, uh, they're called retaining walls, and they're just kind of large pieces of concrete. When a wave hits that, it's the energy has to be dispersed somewhere going to go to the sides, it's going to go around it, and it's going to greater impact the properties on the other sides. So this is something that planners have to think about and using technology to look at slopes and, uh, you know, places where they're going to see heavier rain events, we can get a sense of where these issues are going to be more important. Okay, so back to an interactive portion. Uh, how did you get to school today? Um, because transportation is something we think about a lot too. And there's, well, there's probably a right answer, but uh, everybody got to school in a different way. So um, this is more just an opportunity to, uh, for you to think about how you got to school. And um, again, there's no right answer. So uh, just take a second and you can fill that in. Um, I went to high school in Toronto. So I actually took public transportation to high school, I got on the uh, TTC and that took me where I needed to go. But in uh, elementary school, I lived in a more suburban neighborhood. So I took a school bus. Um, at times, you know, I've been driven by my parents. Uh, there were periods in my life where I could walk or bike to school. That was that was pretty nice. Um, so we do focus a lot on inclusion. And how do we plan for everybody? Um, because that historically hasn't necessarily been what's happened. Uh, and you get certain people whose needs are met. Um, one example is a lot of the ways that cities are designed now is about people getting to work. And that's not so true anymore uh, now that you have uh, a lot of women in the workforce. But historically, that meant that um, there were a lot of things that weren't just considered, uh, like uh, the need for um, strollers to be able to go into different places. Uh, so it there you could almost say that planning has been gendered and focused on getting men from their homes, suburban homes, to their downtown offices. Things are very different now in terms of how society functions. But when you plan a city and you have that infrastructure, it's there for a really long time and it's hard to change. So we do focus a lot more on inclusion now than we used to. We do lots of public engagement exercises. We ask people to come out physically. This is at a farmer's market in St. Andrews. And uh, it's called asset mapping, where you show things that are good about a community. Uh, we can do that digitally as well for people who don't or aren't able to come out. So this is just using Google Maps um, to do kind of the same thing, but you can do this. Uh, there's there's special special mapping programs just for community consultation. That's, that's how important it is. You can also look at a community uh, and use um, mapping to show where is development happening. Um, so this is a very cool tool from the city of Miramichi. 
where you can in real time see where their permits are. So where are people developing? Um, what types of things are people developing? How much does that cost uh, to develop? Um, and that's that's very useful for the public to get a little bit more information. Um, one thing people don't like is surprises and change. And so when there is change happening, uh, if you can not surprise people with it, that's really good. And so this is a great tool for giving the public more information about what's happening behind the scenes. So we uh, did that quiz about transportation. Um, and this is another very cool digital tool. Uh, it's actually a game that was put together by Black Arcs, that company I mentioned earlier. Um, and it's it's interactive. Uh, I don't think it's up and running now. I think they they brought this on iPads to a community consultation, and there was probably a time uh, limit to when people could access it. But you can put different things in different places. So you can say, I want a restaurant here, office here. Uh, we're going to have you know police and fire services down here. And you can actually see how putting different things in different places impacts the amount of people using public transportation, how it impacts GHG emissions, the more people using public transportation and less in their personal vehicles, um, the less GHG emissions there are. So where buildings are in a community, where different things are, um, that really impacts climate change. And you can make all the personal decisions you want. And obviously those are good things to do, but a lot of this work is done by planners and it's very important for planners to think about climate change and where buildings are going because the way that people get around places um, it impacts climate it impacts health um, the more people have to get in cars usually there's a correlation with uh, less less health uh, poor health outcomes so you know obesity diabetes things like that. And if you can have people who are able to walk or bike, um, if, if they're able to, that's really good for your physical and mental health. We also use digital tools to design streets. Um, this is a free online tool called Street Mix. So you can go there and, and, and try it out and you can see what different streets will look like and you can play around with different widths of bike lanes and you can put uh, divided barriers, like a planter box in between them. Um, and so this is really useful uh, for the public as well to show them how street designs can change. It's also good for elected officials. A lot of the people I'm trying to convince of things are elected officials, so municipal councilors, mayors, people like that. And just like with the buildings, having uh, representations um, as realistic as possible is is very helpful and helps people see the future and and hopefully see that it it can be a, a slightly better future. Now, digital innovation is great, but um, one of the things I do love about my job is that I get to actually get out in the real world and interact with some of these things. So, um, active transportation, uh, even in rural places, is a big part of of planning. And I was uh, able here to, to go out and try out some trails uh, around St. Andrews and um, get a little bit muddy. This was a, a very rainy day, but it was a lot of fun. Um, and once you start to learn these things about a population, uh, you can have a, a bridge like this one in Fredericton that is being decommissioned as a train bridge, but uh, some smart person said, well, that should be a, a bridge for pedestrians. And uh, if you're in Fredericton, you probably use this bridge. Um, you can bike across it, walk across it. It's it's very, very popular uh, and it really helps people get around the city without having to get in their cars. Housing is an area that I focus on a lot and there's a lot of technology that goes into housing now, um, into the way that different systems are put in a house to be as efficient as possible. Um, and then you can even graph this and see how using different materials, uh, different energy sources, 
um, like an uh, LED light versus an incandescent light. Um, that's something that, you know, a lot of people, if you're changing a light bulb in your home now, you're probably getting an LED light, which is going to last for 20, 30 years versus that incandescent, which is going to last maybe a year or two. Um, this kind of helps you take all of those decisions and look at, you know, different uh, types of insulation that keeps heat in your house. Um, and show you how to create the most energy efficient building for the least amount of money possible. And that's all using math and uh, stuff that I have no idea how it works, but you just plug it into these things and, and they give you the answer. On the more human side of housing, it's not just about the actual way that houses are built. Um, we focus on, on trying to make sure that housing is inclusive as well and that there's places in every community for every type of person to live and and maybe they want to own their own house um that's that's not easy for a lot of people these days so we need to focus on more rental housing which historically is not something that new brunswick especially rural areas in new brunswick have had a lot of and then there's all these other types of housing too and this is a fantastic project uh, on the north side of fredericton called 12 neighbors and um, it's it's a project um, that has gotten, I think, at the, by this point, 20 or 30 folks off of the street. Uh, everybody who is living here now was at one time unsheltered or homeless. And uh, they this organization built these tiny homes. Uh, they're about 200 square feet, so they're pretty small. Um, you know, really just enough for uh, basic necessities, but it's it's shelter and it's a community. You can see here um, that, you know, it's like a little street and you've got your front porch and they've also built an employment opportunity. So these folks uh, are, are building more of these houses now, these tiny houses, they're building park benches. Um, so not only is it a place to live, but it's a place to find some some work as well. And uh, there may be the opportunity for other communities to find sites and, and purchase some of these tiny homes and create a similar program. So uh, it's always nice when you can find a success story in, in life and good news. And this is a great uh, success story, the 12 Neighbors Project in Fredericton. So we're coming to the end here. Um, I think this is our last quiz. Uh, this is what. What uh, we're asking, what do planners need to consider when planning communities? So is it uh, protection of the environment? Is it the health and well-being of residents? Is it transportation options? Is it the layout and design of buildings and streets, community character and vibrancy, or efficient use of land, resources, and infrastructure? So I'll give a second there. You can choose more than one. If I set the quiz up right, and if you've been paying attention, uh, hopefully you selected every single one because planners do have to consider all of these factors when we're doing our jobs and probably some more too. So this has been a very broad overview of the different types of technologies planners use and, and um, some of the different activities we do, but I just wanted to kind of give you a few more things that that I do specifically and other planners. And uh, we do fly drones. Uh, it's very exciting, um, a little scary sometimes. But uh, these are just just kind of some eye candy drone shots that planners across the province have taken. Um, and again, that's a great technology. It helps us uh, view things from the air. You can you can see different features of the land and um, it's really nice to have satellite imagery. It's nice to be able to go on the ground and see something, but it's really nice to have that in between. And and so if you like uh, flying drones, then planning is something where you get to do that. One of the most important things in, in every decision that I make as a planner and every recommendation I give to municipal council is, is I, I need to act in the public interest. It's uh, I'm here on behalf of the New Brunswick Association of Planners. We're a professional association. Um, we have professional standards and acting in the public interest is the most important one. Uh, we're not acting in the interest of any one 
person. Um, we're not acting in the interests of a business. Um, we're not acting in the interest of a neighborhood. We need to act in the public interest, which means everybody and not just everybody who's here now, but everybody in the future. And um, that can be very complicated and and there may be competing interests. And it's very, it's probably the most challenging thing I do is figuring out what is the public interest in this specific case. Obviously, community consultation can really help with that. Um, so these are all uh, different different events where people came out and um, you know gave gave some input on to what would be their public interest and maybe they think a little bit more broadly too and say you know I've noticed this thing and people are having a real problem at this uh, street corner because there's no curb there and I see you know people in wheelchairs who are getting stuck and and things like that. Um, so by consulting with the public, it really helps us understand what the public interest is. But we have to remember too, that not everybody shows up and there are members of the public um, who historically haven't had their voices heard as much. So that's going back to that inclusion piece, very important. And it's not just uh, adults who are important in planning, it's, it's everybody. So um, it's really great when we have youth and kids come out to planning exercises, um, because when we think about planning for the future, really it's 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 uh, young folks um, who are going to be living that future. So we really need to consider them, and we want places that are great for kids. Uh, and there's, you know, as you age too, there's there's a lot of things that um, it's not just good for kids. It's not just good for older folks. Uh, there's there's a concept called eight to eighty cities. So a city that is great for anybody from the age of eight to 80. I probably let's let's go from zero to 100. Um, but accessibility, uh, age friendly communities, um, they create benefit for everybody, not not just the people that you might think are going to be impacted. Um, so just a very kind of quick listing of things that I do every day. I do lots of research. Um, you've seen some of that. I go on site visits and field trips. You've seen some of that. I have meetings. Uh, I left that out because meetings are boring. I give presentations, um, kind of like this one, although they're more targeted for specific uh, development projects. I do a lot of mapping. Um, a lot of the maps that I put in this presentation are things that I've made. I work on policies, so that kind of uh, you know, writing text of, of how uh, development should happen, um, which which is very interesting. Uh, I give advice to municipalities. I show up at council meetings and, um, you know, when there's a planning matter, I will say to council, you know, here's here's what I think about this. Here's if you want to act in the public interest, here's the best way to do that. And, you know, here's what your bylaws say about planning and here's how that should be interpreted. Um, as a professional planner, I have an authority to do that. I communicate a lot, lots of emails, lots of phone calls, in-person meetings, uh, lots, lots of talking. That's a very social profession. I get to work on some design things, uh, which is fun, and learn a lot. Um, because of where I am in southwest New Brunswick, I've had to learn a lot about aquaculture and, and fishing and uh, when I went to school for planning in Toronto, that was not anything that I learned about. But as someone who loves to learn, it's it's great. And uh, the more that I can learn about the world and how it works, the happier I am. And so planning is a great way to do that. And if that's something you're interested in, there's various things you can do now. And uh, as you progress a little bit through your schooling to get involved in planning, you can you can join clubs and committees. You anybody can go to a council meeting. They're open to the public. Um, there will be public community consultations. Some uh, MPs even have youth councils. Travel and just think about the world. Talk to your friends and family about the future and think about why things are the way they are. Don't just necessarily accept them. Somebody made a decision somewhere based on something. Um, and there's no reason why you can't be involved in that decision. Some of the subjects that are related to planning in school, uh, probably geography, social studies, environment, economics, civic studies, um, 
there's there's all sorts of different things we do write a lot so uh you know having a good ability with uh whatever language that is french or english um is pretty important too you need to be able to convince people of things with your writing and finally some uh you know if, if you're really interested in planning and and you want to go to school further for that post-secondary um obviously you, you should finish high school um you can get an undergraduate degree in planning they offer them at dow lots of schools uh, but dow is the one in the maritimes um but you don't have to get an undergrad degree in planning you can uh myself i got a master's degree in urban planning um but you can become a professional planner without doing either of those you will need an undergraduate degree of some kind but there are professional pathways that you don't have to do the masters you don't need the undergrad in planning you're just going to have to put in a little bit more time so uh i'm going to end there and uh i don't know if we're doing questions or or anything like that but i'll just turn it back over to adam <clears throat> perfect that was uh that was really fantastic xander and and thank you for for walking us through uh, all the important work that you do, because like you said, it pretty much touches every uh, every facet of our lives in one way or another, from the environmental issues to uh, density issues and, and just overall making our communities the best that they can be. And people like you doing the hard work every day, um, a lot of people might not get to, to learn about you. So um, I think that's uh, really fascinating. And obviously all the technology that's being used now, and it just continues to evolve, I think, um as time goes on um and, and and that's something that in the center we're hoping to talk more about things like artificial intelligence what are ways that we can use some of that technology to to improve your job or to help you make decisions um i think it's going to be fascinating and i'm sure and you're, you're probably like seeing things develop and unfold the new ways to use stuff so when drones kind of first came out it was like oh that's a fun toy but all of a sudden it turns into a pretty serious tool that um folks like you can use so um, I do thank you. Uh, the uh, the uh, the quiz was great. I know I participated in that, um, and everything worked uh, really well on our end. So what we'll do is, like I said, we'll uh, we'll post this up, and um, we uh, we will be in touch. And, and again, we really thank you for um, for for doing this today. Awesome. Well, it was great. It was great to do it, and uh, I'm always happy to you know be involved. And I'm sure people can get my contact information information through you. So if there's you know teachers or students who want to follow up further, I'm always I'm always open. And the association is uh, very happy to tell people about planning. Perfect. And that's a, that's a good thing to end on. And, and I will make sure to, um, to, you know, spread the word to the teachers that especially there's some specific high school courses that would probably appreciate having yourself maybe as a guest speaker, You're not, you know, not for a full hour or anything, but you could talk to pop in for half an hour and uh, the students really appreciate that. So thanks again. And uh, I hope you have a great day.